Uh, we're going to the next one of our uh, special specialist talks. And we're very fortunate to have Jim Edwards with us. Uh, Jim is one of the key software engineers in our uh, CSM, um, so CSEG, uh, Software Engineering Group. That's right. Yeah. And so he's one of the key people who helps build, support, and make sure everything runs that we, as we're doing all that great science. Um, Jim actually was, uh, and with Chris Fisher, put together the, the, um, the tag that we're using, the version of the code we're actually using for the, the tutorial. And uh, Jim's got a lot of insight that he can provide for like, how do you use this model? Not just in the, the Cheyenne environment, but in, in other environments as well. And so we're gonna look at some uh, ideas of, of porting. And I thought Brian was gonna put some stuff in, but maybe I've not. I've got a couple of slides from Brian and Mariana. We we consolidated and I'm going to do the whole thing. Right. Um, so CSM lab and a little bit of the idea about yeah, yeah. running CSM in the cloud. So using um, things like Amazon, um, the AWS, the mm -hmm. scaling it out across cloud services. So um, with that, I'll hand over to Jim and he can give you uh, an insight into the mechanics of how do you run this model outside of here. Thanks, Peter. Hi, everybody. Welcome, thanks for coming back. I know this was an optional uh, lecture, so I appreciate you coming back and, and being here. We're gonna talk about uh, porting scene-based models. Uh, CESM is a scene-based uh, model. E3SM is another one. Um, there are a few others besides those two. And we're gonna talk about porting those to different uh, architectures. Um, so a couple of ways to do it. Um, there are, are predefined uh, Homebrew and CentOS uh, 7 Linux uh, definitions. That's a good place to start if you're porting to your laptop. Um, if you're uh, porting to an HPC system, there's a, there's a ton of examples in the config machines files of various HPC systems. And you can very often find one of those that's pretty similar to your own and you know follow that as a template. Um, so you can define a new machine locally in your home uh, .scene directory, uh, or you can define a new machine and, and submit a pull request to seam, and then we'll keep that updated as we as we uh, do uh, further development. So if you get a new code base, it should still work on uh, on your machine with the original port. Um, so the home.seam directory, it's, um, when you, when you build a C model, it's going to look for this directory and you can put files in there, um, for seam to use. So the important files are this config machines.xml, which has a description of the machine you're using. Uh, config compilers defines the compilers that you can use on that machine and config Config batch defines the, the batch system. So PBS or Slurm or um, uh, LFS, whatever you're using there. Um, so Homebrew or CentOS 7, Homebrew is a Mac, uh, a Mac uh, packages support. And we have a Homebrew definition that you can use. Um, so basically on your laptop, you would install Homebrew from their site, um, install the GCC compiler, and then NetCDF and MPitch. Um, <clears throat> and then you wanna create a couple of directories uh, that, that uh, the scratch directory is where your output will go. Input data is where your input data, the, the initial conditions files for the model will go. And then you would use this machine homebrew to create new case. And the same thing with the CentOS 7. Um, this uses uh, modules from LMOD. Um, and then you would install, you know, compilers, uh, MPI, NetCDF, and create a couple of directories. And then you can go uh, from there. So you want to copy. Uh, this template file, config machines template into your uh, .seam and edit that file to fit your machine. And I'll go through, I'm gonna go through uh, line by line, the things in that file and what you have to consider when you, uh, 
when you change it. Um, and then once you can so, <clears throat> once you can successfully build submit a case, um, you can transfer those changes um, into manage changes make okay. And then you can run the system test to verify your port. Um, config file can contain custom settings for variables used by the case control system. It could also be used to customize the case control uh, code logging. Uh, but we found um, actually this file doesn't get used much. Config machines is probably the most important oh, most important file you need to be aware of um, when you're doing a port and um, We'll look through that line by line, like I said, and, and see how to, to adjust it. Um, okay, so you, you have the slides to be able to go back and explain by line. Right. Yeah, you can contact us. Yeah, and I'll be here this afternoon during the practical session. You know, if you have any questions, um, bring them up now or or bring them up then, that's, that's fine. Um, so the config machines file, it's an XML uh, format file. Oops, can I go back? Oh, there we go, okay. Um, and then, uh, so you give your machine a, a name. The name doesn't really have to correspond to any name that the machine already has. It's just whatever you call it in, in here. Um, usually you do want it to correspond to the machine name to avoid confusion. Um, and then some, you know, some kind of description. This is an optional field. Um, the node name reg, reg, the node name regex field can be used to automatically identify the machine, so that you don't need the uh, machine option to create new case um, for for that machine. It will just automatically know that it's that it's running on that machine. Um, there are several cases where the node name regex won't work. Um, so for example, if you have one machine with two types of, of processors, then you may need to define that as two different machines, you know, one machine definition for processor A, one for processor B, so that, um, you can, you know, fine tune which ones you want to use. And then one of them can have the node name regex and the other one would not, you would just use the machine name for that. Um, Yeah. Okay, then you want to <clears throat> give it the operating system. Um, there's a few are a few possibilities here. Linux, uh, AIX. Uh, I haven't seen an AIX system in in a really long time. It's probably been four or five years, so I don't know if that even works anymore. And then uh, Darwin for um, Mac OS, and CNL is a Cray. Um, variant of the operating system. Um, some machines require a proxy for uh, access to the internet. Uh, if you have one of these machines, you probably know about it. Or, you know, if you if you get on a machine, you fig figure out you can't access the internet from it, talk to your system administrators. There's probably a proxy address to get out. Uh, then you want to list the compiler supported on the machine. Um, it's a common separated list and the first one is going to be the default. So if you don't, if you do create new case and you don't specify a compiler, that's the one you'll get. If you do specify a compiler, it, it should be in this line. Um, and then we support Intel, GNU, PGI, now uh, NV, I think it's called NVHPC is the replacement for PGI. Um, NAG is a Fujitsu compiler that we support. Did I forget any? GCC, oh, in the new, uh, uh, yeah, the new, the new C-Lang, that's it. C-Lang compilers that are coming out. Uh, that's the default on Mac now. Uh, MPI libs. Um, 
MPT is the SGI HPE version of MPITCH. We support Open MPI. IMPI is uh, Intel's version of MPITCH. Um, I think that's about all the MPI libraries we support. Um, the project is an optional field. Uh, a lot of HPC systems require you to have a, a project in your job submit. This will fill that in if it's there. Um, and if, if, you, if you put it in there, that means it will be required to be filled in in your Q submit. But if you don't put it in there, it's optional. Okay, the seam output route is where your model is gonna write its, uh, its output. So you generally want that to be on some kind of parallel file system, GPFS or Luster. And, um, and it should be, you know, if you can, it should be a pretty large space because you're gonna use a lot of it. Um, and on, on Cheyenne, we use the scratch space, which is, a uh, has it has a quota, so you know after six months or so your data gets blown away. I think um, the DN loc root is where the input data is going to go. Um, if you're on a shared system, we recommend that everybody use the same input data because it can be up to several terabytes of data, and you don't want you know each individual user having their own copy. Um, so if you are on an HPC system. Um, try to find a way to put that in a shared space. Um, sometimes that requires talking to system administrators to find out what the best space is for that. Um, you want it to be writable by everyone who's going to use it. So you might have to do a special group to handle that. <clears throat> on, uh, on Cheyenne, we use, we use a group, um, CSM. We have a CSM group on Cheyenne so that everybody shares that. On uh, the the Texas uh, TAC systems, they use um, access control lists, which is a different uh, different way of handling file permissions on file file systems. Um, so we support both of those. Uh, so DN loc root can can grow rather large. It could be like I said, up to three or four terabytes of data. Um, but you should know that. It only the model will only download what you need for a given case. So when you when you build a case, it's only going to download the input data it needs for that case. Um, but it doesn't it doesn't purge it after you get rid of the case. You have to you know any purging you do would have to be on your um, would be by hand, but would be something you do on your own. Um, yeah. Let's see. Uh, D out S root is that's where your archive directory is. That's uh, when you you do a run, you know, it'll run the model. You'll get some output, and then by default, it will move that output into an archive directory to save for later, so that you don't uh, corrupt that output with your next run. Um, this is the path to that directory that it's going to go in. Baseline root is in, in CPRNC. Um, these are our testing locations. You don't really need to, to worry about those too much. Um, you need to point, sometimes um, GNU, make, GNU make is usually called make on the systems. I, I think that's 90% that's true these days, but sometimes there is a system make that's not quite compatible with GNU make, and then there's gmake, which is compatible. And so you need to, to put that name gmake in here um, or, or make in there if that's the case. Uh, here's the batch systems. We support a few, Cobalt, LSF, PBS, Slur. You would put that in there. Um, contact information for support. Uh, so, you know, put your email address in there if you, if you dare. <laughs> okay, max task per node and max MPI task per node are, are a little bit uh, confusing. 
So a lot of machines, a lot of especially HPC systems have uh, symmetric multi-threading, which allows a CPU to act like two or four separate CPUs within the operating system. And so um, you can, for example, if you have uh, 36 actual CPUs on a node in four-way multi-threading, you might set this to uh, 144 to maximize that, that multi-threading capability. Um, but you don't want the MPI task to exceed the actual number of CPUs. Um, at least we found that the performance of putting MPI on these symmetric multi-threads doesn't, it doesn't uh, pan out. So generally stick to uh, max MPI task per node to be the physical number of CPUs that you have on a, a node. And the max task per node can take advantage of that SMT capability by you know, doubling or, or quadrupling, whatever the SMT uh, feature is on your machine. Oh, project required. If it's true, then the project field above has to be filled in. Um, that's where that came from. And then um, you have to tell it how to run a job. So, you know, what you specify in the MPI run command, how that's done. On, on Cheyenne, there's a special MPI run called MPI exec underscore MPT. So we, you know, set that in there. Um, this, you can have this clause for each of the MPI libraries that you support on a machine. Machine. So if you have, you know, MPT plus OpenMP, you would have a clause like this for each one of those. Um, and then, you know, give the arguments to the, to the uh, MPI exec. So um, one common one that's probably in just about every one of, every one of the MPI libraries is, you know, what is, what is the total number of tasks that you're going to run? Um, another one that I like is label the IO so you know which task of your multitask job the IO came from. Um, and thread placement, that's kind of a Cheyenne unique thing. Uh, we support various types of software module systems, um, the LMOD modules. Uh, the tickle modules, which are uh, another variant of modules. And then there's uh, something called uh, soft ENV, which I think is uh, Lawrence Livermore uh, unique system that they use. Um, so we support all three of those. And uh, you put your, your module commands, you know, if you, if you want to start from a clean environment, you might purge first and then load, you know, whatever you need. This is an old slide, so it's Intel 16 here. Um, but that, you know, gives you an idea of the modules. And then, did I cover that? Uh, let's see. Oh. Uh, you can set environment variables in your uh, MV machines, so MPI type depth is something we need for MPT. Um, OMP stack size is generally uh, a setting. If you're going to use threads, you need that. Um, okay, so once you've edited, you've added the things you need in config machine. In config machines, you can test that with an XML lint command. That'll, uh, that'll tell you that the uh, Changes you made are, are uh, XML uh, correct, and it'll you know give you a line number, a nice error message if if they're not. Um, and then we, <clears throat> and then you would go on to config compilers, and uh, it has a default definition for each supported compiler, and then and then beyond that you can amend the definition with machine specific sections. So. Here's one for a machine called Hobart in the compiler nag, and it needs a couple extra uh, CPP flags, needs its no C size of. 
it needs to append a pthread flag and uh, a nag library flag. So you can you know add those and those will only apply on that machine uh, Hobart. And again, you can test for correctness with the XSD. And, and that generates a file called macros.make in the case directory. If you look in that uh, file, you can verify that the things you expected to be there are there. Um, use it, yeah. So then config batch is where you would, you would uh, again, there are defaults for each batch system. There's a set of defaults and then you can uh, customize that for a given machine. Um, so here's the machine Blue Waters that retired a couple of years ago. I'm going to have to update some of these. Uh, and, um, you know, so you could specify particular directives that that machine understands. Um, and you, you need to specify for each machine the queues. Um, so what the default queue is, uh, what the wall, the max wall time is. And you can specify, you know, the minimum and maximum job size that should be used for that queue. And then there's a, uh, a test script called scripts regression tests. Um, it requires that you build and install uh, CPRNC, which is there's a readme in the in the um, source code for how to do that. Um, it optionally uses a Pilot tool, which you can install with pip or conda, and then run from that same scripts test directory, and it will make sure that your uh, your port is solid, is okay. And then <clears throat> there's also this uh, test called the CSM Ultrafast Ensemble Consistency Test, ECT. Um, and what this does is, is it conducts three run model runs of nine time steps each. So they're really short runs. Um, and then you can upload those to uh, this path that I can't read. Can you read that? Anyway, you can get the slides and read it. It's the wrong color. Um, you can upload it to, these, to this path. And then what it does is it, it compares that against an ensemble that we've run on our, our uh, current quote unquote truth system. So it looks at, at this ensemble of about 300 members, make sure that your nine time step runs fit within the bounds of the ensemble. Um, if, you, if you don't fit within the bounds, then there's probably some, some problem on your end that needs to be corrected. Um, yeah, and so it's just a pass or fail test, happens pretty quickly. Um, there's also a, a separate one, this is the, uh, uh, this is the atmosphere test. There's also a separate one for the ocean, but it requires you run for about a year. So it, it takes a little longer. And then uh, some resources for help. The CG, CGD forum um, is at uh, forum.cgd.ucar.edu. Any questions you have about, about porting, about uh, pretty much anything CSM related, um, if you go to that forum, uh, and post your question, you usually get a response pretty quickly. Um, and then the, the GitHub page for CSM is here and the scene development page is, is here. And then just a couple more things. Um, you've been looking at your, your tutorial is based on CSM 2.1. Um, which was the model version used for the CMIP-6 experiments. Um, we've gone on in development since then, and um, we're now in a CSM 2.3 uh, version. Um, and there's been some significant changes that I just wanted to tell you about a few of them. The MCT coupler driver has been replaced with the ESMF-based uh, CMIPS is the community mediator earth prediction systems. Um, and CDEPS is the community data models for earth prediction systems. Um, so CMEPS and CDEPS are new replacements for what were the MCT coupler driver and data models. Um, 
they're a lot more flexible, uh, much easier to use, I think, than, than the other ones were. Um, we have a lot more interchangeable component options. Uh, so we now have uh, the MOM ocean model replacing the POP model, um, CI6 replacing CI5. We have a new Wave Watch model. Um, we have uh, several uh, outside uh, developers that have developed uh, uh, the NEMO ocean model in Europe. Um, there's another atmospheric model also in Europe that has been developed that can just, you know, they can go in and replace um, the standard models we need to do that. It's also much easier to introduce new grids in, in this new uh, model version. Um, we've reduced the number of, of required offline generated grid files from 25 to about four, from about 25 to four. Um, so uh, porting to a new grid um, using um, um, regionally refined grids is much, much easier in this version of the model than, uh, than the old one. And then um, we're also introducing uh, containers, uh, use of containers to uh, make uh, porting a lot easier. Um, so now we have con uh, containers with ready to run, oh, ready to run CSM software. Um, they're portable across multiple, that button, across Mac, Windows, and Linux. Um, there's a CSM lab container currently that includes a Jupyter lab environment and a basic tutorial. Uh, I think the plan is for next year's CSM tutorial to be based on that CSM lab. Is that right? Or similar? Yeah. Um, and then um, we're also working on an HPC version. Um, so I think uh, at some point in the future, instead of doing this whole porting exercise with config machines and stuff, you would just run a, a container on whatever HPC system you have. And uh, that's gonna make life a lot easier, I think. And then uh, we also have uh, work in the cloud. So CSM can now run on um, Amazon. What is, the, what is AWS? Amazon Web Services, right? That's it. Um, and Azure is, is uh, Google Cloud um, working on that as well. It's fully pre-configured, no porting is necessary. Um, Cloud costs are generally much higher than HPC systems, especially uh, disk space and storage cost can can in the cloud can really break break the bank. So, you know, be aware of that if you're going to be running in the cloud. Um, and um, we don't have a website up, or a web page describing these uh, uh, cloud container environments yet, but we're working on it, and that should be up uh, this summer sometime. And uh, yeah, that's all I have. We have any questions? Can you go back on your slides to the config machines? Yeah. Slides, sorry. I've got a question no about a port. <laughs> we keep, keep going. Right to the start with a uh, node name rig X. Oh, the node name rig X? Yeah. Uh, oh. That would one be... more. Maybe. Two more. Another one. Yep. <laughs> it was it was there it is. So if I specify the machine as my machine in my create new case, do I now not need node name rig X? Right. If you if you do not if if you specify, you know, minus nice machine equals whatever yep. this string is, mm -hmm. then you don't need that node name reg X. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, it was very helpful. Uh, I just had a quick question about message passing interface. Uh, I don't remember which slide it was, but my question was, am I able to set up a manager worker relationship all within this? It, 
is there a manager worker relationship where? Am I able to code manager worker relationship right here with your MPI exec commands? Uh, I what, guess what, I, no, I, th I think what happens is all of the parallelism is built into the, the compilers and, and the MPI libraries. Mm -hmm. So you won't be able to reconfigure the MPI libraries and how they're used. And what you can do is you can tell it which sets of libraries to use for, for message passing and for like for the parallelism. But so that I think you have multiple different multiple different MPI libraries that you can choose from. So so various vendors, various uh, sources build MPI libraries. They all conform to the same standard, but they all have you know slight differences. The way that MPI is being activated within CSM I is that you can change the layout and the, and the resources, mm. but you can't actually say I want this to have this many workers and this many like. I said, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs>